Welcome to the Be Effective Podcast. This episode is sponsored by Effective Fitness Training, daily workouts for police officers. Join us in the fight to end the mediocre fitness standard. Effective Fitness Training takes a science and data-driven approach towards fitness, specifically for police officers. The programming is delivered through an app available on both Apple and Android. You'll get daily workouts along with rehab programs for shoulders, knees, and lower back. The data shows that those areas are commonly injured within law enforcement, so we have to make those strong. Nutritional guidelines to help us in the right direction of what to eat, when to eat, and how much to eat so we can lose the unwanted pounds and pack on the muscle we need. Push-up pull-up programs, supplemental running programs, and the list goes on. But most importantly, you get 24-7, 365 PT and strength and conditioning support from our team. So it's basically one-on-one coaching. You can send videos about your form. You can ask questions regarding injury, nutrition, et cetera. The list goes on. The team at Effective Fitness is there for you. Made up of former and active law enforcement along with a team of medical professionals. There are multiple cycles available, including an EFT cycle, a tactical bodybuilding cycle, all accompanied by a body weight program in case you're away for travel or your gym is still closed. That's in line with the program so you can continue to make gains because that's what's important. Not only will this program make you effective, it will also help benefit other necessary disciplines for law enforcement or those that want to be effective, such as jujitsu, defensive tactics training, shooting, and the list goes on. We understand we also incorporate agility, mobility, and recovery. They play a major role in the success and the foundation of our survival when it comes to our physical health. So for more information, visit effective.fitnesstraining on Instagram. That's effective.fitnesstraining on Instagram. Episode five. Mr. Scott Bucket. Scott's a good buddy of mine. Met him back at a Bob Keller class a few years ago, and him and I hit it off pretty well. Scott served in the Marine Corps. After that, he served in Iraq and Afghanistan with Blackwater as a contractor, working with Department of State, DOD, etc. After his time overseas, he came back, became a police officer for a number of years, working in many different capacities, SWAT, special operations, all that kind of stuff. But Scott is, he's Mr. Expendable. Like he looks like he belongs in the movie, The Expendables, where he's a 48 year old dude that is jacked as shit. Phenomenal resource when it comes to fitness and health. He was actually a wellness coordinator um, at a local sheriff's office here. Scott has a phenomenal background. He brings a lot of experience to the table. So without further ado, episode five, Mr. Scott Puckett. Enjoy. Class, um, and then Scott and I stayed in touch. Uh, we hit some more training up, went to that, uh, I, think I saw you again. I've, I've, I've seen you a bunch of places, but I saw you again at the uh, at the FBI Let's Class. Uh, you came down and stopped by during the during the vehicle portion, I believe. Yeah, man. Yeah. That was that was that was some really good training there. But yeah, man. And then uh, and then Scott now is is now director of operations of 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 the sawmill. And you guys you guys heard it. They have all kinds of training going on. They've had uh, who all have you had down there so far? Oh man, wow. So. This so it's really cool, man. This is I'm celebrating a year this week. Oh wow! That, that a year ago, flies. yeah, man. Flies. Well, it was actually yeah. technically last week. The uh, these guys showed up from uh, Catawba County, North Carolina. The, they have a, a what's called Star Team, and it's it's a multi-jurisdictional SWAT team is what it is, made up of the sheriff's department there and other agencies within their uh, within their jurisdiction to plus up and to augment the team and to keep the team, you know, fresh, full of talent and young people and guys that are 
being capable, you know, not obviously just young, but capable people for the SWAT team. And so they, they came in on Sunday and we basically celebrated a year together. They brought the banjo, a little picking and grinning. I didn't, I was just listening and enjoying it. There you go. And, uh, and so they're here now. And, um, uh, Let's see. Since then, since these guys, which makes a full year, we've had I've had local SWAT, I've had FBI out here, I've had uh, a multitude of civilians, man, which I'm really stoked about. Of course, the That's military awesome. coming out here, uh, all kinds of different agencies, state, local, federal. You, they've been through here, but again, man, I'm really stoked to the fact that there's a lot more civilians taking taking charge and responsibility for themselves and their own safety, you know? Sure. And that's, you know, and that's something that you and I have always, have always harped on because, you know, uh, as former law enforcement guys, you know, we were always never there. Right. Usually when the call happened, we were never there. Right. right. Like, it, so, so the that incident, right. So the incident ha- has already occurred. So really it puts the hands, uh, uh, of the outcome into the, individual there which is not law enforcement which is usually not anybody of authority or anybody of of that capacity and so this is why the importance of training regardless of occupation is extreme is extremely important that's and that's so awesome that you extend those classes um not you know I mean, obviously there there are different classes right like you're not going to be doing um you know like an fbi class or a no-name class with with uh with uh civilians right Right. Uh, just, you know, just it's an open enrollment, you know, what we're, right. What right. We're sure. So, so what are your biggest hits when it comes to civilian classes? Wow, man, by far the most popular that we've had. And it's, a, it's huge. It's been huge since April is uh, Mike Glover and Phil craft survival, man. And Kevin and Raul and the boys, man, they came in here like gangbusters back in April. And since then, it's blown up. We've had some big hits, even you know through June, when it's as you know, it's here in South Carolina, it's blazing hot, man. But oh yeah, they filled the house. They filled the house, man. They come in here, and it's it's a it's a busy weekend. And that's awesome, it, man. And my uh, boys are coming back in in November, uh, the 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. I was just again. I was just in Montana. Uh, and I believe Mike was, as I was leaving, he was coming in and I actually reached out to Mike and was trying to, and was trying to meet up with him, uh, prior to leaving Montana, but I definitely would like to get him on the podcast cause you know, I love, uh, I love his outlook on, uh, on certain things. And, and I mean, he, he's obviously got a shit ton of experience, which is, yeah. which is he's a brilliant and, and very uh, intelligent articulate oh, dude oh, yeah. with, a, with a ton of relevant experience. It, yeah, it's what absolutely. I call like guys like Bob, man, is that whole application versus theory teaching model, man. If they, you know, these guys teach from application, not just a theoretical mindset, you know? Right. Right. And I actually talked about, we went into depth a little bit about the mindset of training and gunfighting, you know um, you know, I, I don't have any experience in that. Um, so this is kind of why I, I, you know, I mean, as a cop, right. I mean, you think about it, most cops, I think it's like 99.95% of cops never get into, uh, an officer involved shooting incident. It's not to say they haven't been in a thousand other critical incidences that, you know, I mean, you know, you look at cops in major cities, uh, or cops in high crime areas, you know, the amount of time or the amount of slack that's been taken out of the trigger is probably uncountable. Right. Um, but but you know no shots have been fired and that's you know again we have to make we have to make sure people understand cops don't want to shoot people right yeah and you know that's an interesting yeah. piece of data man that i would love to know more about because there's a lot of cops that are, are, are quite a few that i've talked to over the years and meet and met and or read about and or you know studied that were uh that had been in multiple gunfights you know and yep. it begs oh, the yeah. question, why? Why is it that, that again, that the, the 1%, if you will, are in the majority of the gunfights? So, I don't know, man. It's just it's curious. I'm curious about that. That's yeah, I mean, you know, I think it also depends on the type of the type of police officer, right? You know, I mean, it really depends on their level of motivation, the, the targets they're going after, um, you know, the area they know. And sometimes, sometimes shit just happens, bro. 
You know, I mean, shit, dude, you know, shit just, oh, shit, yeah. you, you just open the door and you're like, what the fuck? Oh, yeah. Oh, you yeah. know? Um, oh. And, and, you know, I mean, the data there, you know, especially with this most recent shooting in Philly that just happened. Um, yeah. Have you seen it? Oh, yeah. You saw, okay, okay. So, I mean, the guy came at two police officers with a knife. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 this has happened. It's pretty obvious. Pretty cut and dry, right? This has happened multiple times over the past couple months, right? There was a, the, there was that one in Chicago. There was another one, I think, in um, uh, Pennsylvania, um, where 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 a subject uh, approached police officers with with a knife. Length doesn't matter. Of knife is it, a knife's a knife, and so now, of course, the city is burning uh, because of this incident, um, and. What do you think? Because it just feels like every time this happens, every single time so far in 2020, this has happened. Because look, the George Floyd incident, completely different. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about incidences like like Jacob Blake, Richard Brooks, uh, and this incident that just happened in Philly where um, someone approached police officers with a weapon or took a weapon uh, and and then tried to um, use them against the police officer. And, All right. I mean, the precedence is now is if this happens, places burn. Powder keg, yeah. Well, see, that's by design. I, I truly believe there's there's a lot more. Uh, you peel away the layers of the onion, if you will. Sure. But let's talk about this in perspective. You know, a knife, a, a pipe, a stick, a piece of broken glass, a nail, all these things, that's, that's deadly force. That is that is by far across the board in the United States – through every state that I know of and every jurisdiction gives you based on certain circumstances, especially if there's in close proximity, compressed close proximity with a blunt force or sharp, sharp object. Again, scenario dictates that gives you the, the, the right to use deadly force. Now they might not always do it depending on circumstances, no time to shoot, no room to shoot. Then they find that there's no reason to shoot. So we understand that those are those perspectives we've got to, to, sure. to calculate. So, Based on that particular instance here in Philadelphia, it's obvious based on the short clip I saw that the, you know, again, the, the officers come out of the screen right. The, uh, you got a, an individual that's videoing. Again, everybody, every cop right now is an actor on a stage, if you will. They, they're all going to be on video, whether it's body cam, CCTV, cell phones, you name it. ATMs, door ring, bell, camera, whatever. Everything, bro. Everything's everything, recorded. everything is, is up for grabs. So with that being the case, you know, you know, there, there's always going to be a multiple angles as well. So based on what I saw, a guy comes at him. I mean, he had the intent. It looked like everything. He had the intent. He had the opportunity. And there was plenty of jeopardy there, really. So I, with those, you got the, there's, they, they, had, they really didn't have much of a choice. So again, and then when you see the perspective of the street, the way things are closed off, they don't have a duty to retreat. They have a duty to, to stay there and, and to stop the threat. Exactly. You know, and that's what on the brief after action that I did, it's something that, that I really tried to hit on was, was, you know, how far do cops, you know, cause again, we've seen incidences where an individual had a knife and a cop keeps backing up. I can't remember the exact location of this incident, but there was one where um, an individual had a knife, but it was on the side of the highway. I think it was in Ohio and kept backing up, backing up, backing up into traffic, backing up into the highway at some point, you know, de-escalation is not the answer, right? Yeah. So, so well, it's, this is, yeah, yeah, and this is kind of where... Picking time bomb for trouble for... for it, it, exactly, it, you know, because just because there's a threat in front of you doesn't mean there's an 18-wheeler coming down the road that can't stop on a dime that, you know, because now you're putting your life in jeopardy. You're putting now the subject's life in jeopardy because he's, right. you know, he's coming at you. So, no. you know... <clears throat> Use of force, and that's why, and this is what I said in one of my posts was, use of force is not a fair fight. Law enforcement doesn't fight fair. This is not a bar fight. This is not a, a sanctioned match. This right. is a cops are there to end the situation. That's, right. that's it. That's it. And so, and and I think that's what people have a hard time understanding. Yeah, they do. And to put this into perspective, too, the law enforcement. Somebody put, said this recently, and I saw it. Is that Law enforcement doesn't have the responsibility to make sure you're safe in a deadly force encounter or a, a force encounter when you're trying to hurt them. That's, that's no. That point, 
the, the, <laughs> that's it. it you, you've made the decision. Now the law enforcement officer has to defend themselves. They Correct. have to defend her, him or herself. They have to, they have to make a stand to say, all right, now I've got to decide what I'm going to do. And again, you know, we have, it's a slippery slope. What recently happened in California with, with the law changing with just verbiage and in, then in, in, in removing that level of, Hey, what responsibility or what prudent person would do in that, that, that situation? If we take that away. We take a discernment, <clears throat> that decision-making ability away from law enforcement. Then it opens up a whole other Pandora's, Pandora, uh, Pandora's box of problems for the public. You see, that's a ripple effect. It right. all goes back to the public. Yeah. And this is where too, like, I mean, you think about Graham versus Connor. Um, and I know there are some agencies or some, some states, I, I don't know if some states, but they've, they've changed the hindsight 2020, right? Like they've changed, uh, you know, not from the officer's perspective. And that's a problem because you have to think about what a reasonable officer would do in that situation. Uh, you know, and, and it's really not hard case law to understand. Um, I mean, the actual law itself, the actual case is not that hard to understand, but you know, when you apply that to a situation, you know, even Tennessee versus Garner, like that one, I think it was in Arizona where that, I don't know if you saw it, I posted it. Um, the kid, uh, the cop, the kid ran from the cop. The cop was like, oh. hey, why are you running? And then the kid had his yeah. in his pocket, came out and attacked him, uh, stabbed him yeah. in the neck. The officer yeah. chased him down, ended up tasing him. And then, of course, people were like, praising the police officer for this and i'm going yeah i'm going i'm I'm going look so an officer getting stabbed in the neck is okay because he didn't die now what if that officer was stabbed in the carotid and he bled and he didn't know right because i mean you know his adrenaline is running he's probably not going to know and then he dies within a minute and then you would have been like oh well you should have shot him right right well again again it's it's dead if you do dead if you don't always has been that that situation enforcement and you know and I think you brought up a good point too. And um, we talked about this on uh, the podcast with Suresh was, um, you know, the first thing now to a situation is a cell phone. It's not, it's not the media. It's not law enforcement. It's the public. And this is what happens is the public videos it justified or not. It goes, it goes viral in 15 fucking minutes. And then yep. this is when it starts. This is when right. it's it. This is when now it becomes political. There's no there's no due process. There's no evidence collection. There's no investigation. It's just riot and burn everything. And that is right. well. If, it's, yeah. Right. So you have for law enforcement, you've got that you know the the fight of the legal, administrative, and then a court of public opinion, right? Correct. So in the court of public opinion. Normally, the decision is, is, is judged negatively immediately. It's a snap judgment because they only get 15 seconds of a maybe a five-minute scenario, right, or maybe 15-minute scenario, something that led up to it. So what happened before, what happened before, what happened before that, right? And the, the, the problem, there's so many benefits of technology, but the problem with technology is that as people get information way too quickly a lot of times. And because of that, you know, there's a balance, you know, and this is something I wanted and I hope we would talk about is the, the AAR aspect, the after action report that is a must for law enforcement. We see it in larger cities, right? We see it in Philadelphia. We see it in Los Angeles. We see it in Las Vegas. We see it in large areas uh, in New York. I think I've seen some of their, their videos. Um, I could be mistaken, but uh, I want to say I have, but the PIO gets out in front of it. The, uh, they break down the why behind the what, you know, and there's, there's been a, a clarity, if you will. And if they get that out as quickly as possible, that's a huge benefit to that agency and to the public because then it calms the public down. The Absolutely. problem with, that, with those videos like that is that these people, money more than quarterback, somebody that has had yeah, second, they have minutes to decide whether or not that's right or wrong. Again, that goes back to the verbiage of the law. You take that verbiage out and what would a prudent, reasonable person do in that scenario? And then we lose as a public, we lose because then let me tell you what's going to happen. 
this damnification, this demonizing of, of law enforcement officers is preventing talented young people from coming to the profession. They are preventing those with, with, their, with intelligence, with, with grit, with know-how, and you're getting those that they're just, you know, not saying they're not the cream of the crop, but, you know, for instance, the military experience, man, we're losing out on that because a lot of people demonize their, their experience in combat. That's bad, man. And, and I think the perspective, law enforcement's attitude toward millennials, A, and then B, toward like military is, is failed. And who they're bringing to the to the fold, and I would agree with that. Um, I would definitely agree with that, hundred percent. I mean, pay aside, benefits aside, law enforcement. Um, the current status is I can't tell. You, I get countless DMs about uh, from aspiring police officers. Hey, I just graduated college, or um, you know, I just I just got done with high school, or I'm twenty, about to be twenty one. I want to be a police officer, but my family doesn't want me to do it because of this, because of this, but I, I really want to go, but I don't want to upset my family. And that's, you know, again, and, and I mean, just, just seven years ago when I became a police officer, it, it wasn't, I didn't, I didn't, I mean, yeah, I had a little bit of pushback from the family because my family, you know, did have prior service um, and military. And so they were like, you know, are you sure it's what you want to do? Blah, blah, blah. These are the risks. And I was like, yeah, no, I get it. Whatever. I was fucking 24. I was like, I don't care. Risk, Pfft, whatever, <laughs> you know? Um, and so, you know, I, I think that's, I think that's, I think that's a whole, whole different perspective of, you know, is this, is this the right job for me? Is this the right, right job for me? Cause I see what's going on in the media. I see, even though the officers were right, they're still wrong. And yeah. that's, and I mean, you look at officer Rolf in Atlanta, his life, even though justified, his life is over. Yep. Like, I mean, I, I don't want to say it's, it's over in the sense of like, he's well, his life, career but, in law enforcement is likely over. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this thing is he, he's going to have a heart. He's going to have to go, to the mountains with his family. So <laughs> right. and, yeah, I mean, it's I the mean, same thing that happened in Ferguson, you know, with, yeah. uh, with that officer, you know, and, and man, I don't even want to mention his name now too, because people would, it would, you know, let, let the guy have his peace, you know, at this right. point, he didn't do anything wrong, you know, and there's so many more officers like him. I, I, and, it, and, it, and it, and it sucks. It sucks. And, you know, we talk about, the accountability, the accountability aspect of it. When you say about releasing footage and there are some agencies that are on fucking top of that shit. Now they will release the footage within fucking six hours. Right. And they'll say, Hey, good or bad. This is, these are the facts. Make your own conclusion. Please don't burn our city down basically. Um, And again, that is, that is, again, this is the problem that I have with, and this is what I try to tell people. The, George Floyd situation, law enforcement did not hold that body cam footage. I, I, I want to make that very clear. It was the DA that did not want that body cam footage released. And there was a reason why he didn't want it released. Yeah. It was, it was leaked. This is the yeah. thing is the video was leaked. It was not released. And so when you, when you, when you hold a video that has such a huge impact on a country, it's that's psychological warfare. Well, that that's, that's, that's politicizing an issue that's life and death. That's right and wrong. And, that, and sure. that's the problem in this country we're having right now. What we're dealing with is not a matter of politics. It's a matter of right and wrong. Right. You know, anything that usurps the Constitution is illegal. So anything that goes that that, that presses down or is is, uh, it, it, is against the United States Constitution, socialism, communism, Sharia law. I mean, I'm, I mean, it is what it is. It is it's what it illegal, is. And I, I'm going to call it for what it is. And I'm not, I'm not afraid to say that. And that yeah. is because it is not politics. It is the law. Right. Read it. Understand yeah. the constitution. Matter right. of fact, well, I'll tell you what, man, here recently <laughs> I bought, I bought a, uh, it's got somebody to whip it out on us. Hang on a second. I bought a bunch of these to start sending out or giving out when I sell, yep. this is basically the constitution of the United States, the pocket version. It breaks it all down in here, man. These are awesome an awesome uh, you know, resource because people need to know the constitution. They're not teaching it in school anymore, man. No, nope, no, they're, they're not. not. And this, you know, and this too, Scott, as a, as, as a former law enforcement guy, you know, um, especially with all this, all this two a talk going on and, um, you know, this is something where, you know, I, again, I can't speak for all cops, but 
all of the cops that I personally know, right, understand the importance of the Second Amendment, understand the importance of the Constitution, and will say, I took an oath to defend this Constitution. And and there are some cops, again, I can't speak for all, but right. the ones that I know and the ones that I, I'm friends with, because I'm not, I'm, I, I, let's, let's be honest, I'm not going to be friends with someone that wants to take away guns. <laughs> It's just that's just not, not a good idea, man. Because it's not a good idea. You it's fuck wrong. with people's guns, you fuck with it's people's legal. money, they get pissed. They get pissed and then they're gonna do what they gotta do. And that's and that's that, right? And so, you know, it's almost hysterical because whenever we post something about, you know, someone in in possession of a firearm that shouldn't be, right? We're talking about violent felons, uh, and things of that nature. Um, and I had a conversation uh with my buddy Andrew. Um, about about this, and he's extreme. He's a cop, extremely, you know, pro two A, hundred percent, good old country boy, you know. And he he basically told me he's like, you know, it's it's pretty hard to commit a violent felony. Like you have to like go out of your way to say, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna rob that Seven Eleven right there, you know. So for me personally, I think that you know drug crimes or even nonviolent felonies. Right. But when it comes to violent felonies, I, I think that, I think that right should be taken away. Um, you know, murder, rape, you know, yeah. those, those types of crimes cause harm to other people and other people's property, which is against the constitution of the United States. Right. So, so in that matter, I think you should lose that second amendment. Right. However, I could be wrong and I might get criticized for that, but you know, again, uh, drug offenses and, and all that other stuff. I tend, Again, I tend to believe, on, yeah, and I tend to believe the same thing in the sense that that if uh, if you're going to commit a crime like that, it is likely that you're going to repeat that crime, depending on the circumstances. Data shows so, that. Therefore, you know, based on circumstances, case by case, you know, if someone is a violent felon and they they commit crimes over you know, repeatedly, you know, it's it's like the, you can't predict the future, right? But I'm pretty damn good at, at seeing weaknesses in people, processes, and things. All right. And so if you really break it down and you start looking at it, people are going to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. Whatever the case may be, for instance, one in, one in five South Carolinians has a mental emotional disorder. We know that. So if we have a mental or emotional disorder and they have repeatedly committed crime, then I agree with you based on the totality of circumstances that it is likely they should lose their right to possess a deadly well, a, a, a firearm. Rather. Sure. I was, sure. Was a I, taboo I, word, but you know, Right, and that's for not only the safety of other people, but it's also for their safety. That's right. Um, and, and, you know, I think the case by case basis, right? And I mean, there being about three hundred and fifty million people in the country, right. um, you know, that's obviously going to be pretty hard to do, especially with the amount of guns in circulation. And and, and um, you know, I think that I think that this conversation is somewhere. People say, well, cops, you know, are, are, are just bootlickers. I'm still not sure what that actually means. Um, but I, I, I still have yet to find a legitimate definition of the term bootlicker. But anyways, I digress. But I, I, I still feel like the majority of cops support the Second Amendment. The, the majority of cops that I know want people to carry because, again, cops are never the first one, usually never the first one, to an incident, especially right now, proactive policing from at least my understanding of it is, is basically almost non-existent. Yeah. Uh, just because for some right now. Yeah. 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 Fuck. Yeah, dude. I mean, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's we're done. coming, you know, uh, code one. But uh, can you blame them? I no, mean, fuck dude. That's human nature, man. Absolutely. You get burned once. I know if I touch this hot stove, I'm going to burn my hand. <laughs> dude. I use that. I use that analogy yesterday with Bob. That is my, that is my thing is if I see Scott touch a hot stove and him burn himself and he's, he's injured. Yep. Well, I'm not going to touch that shit either. And that's, and that's what basically that's training, right? That's, I mean, yes, you can learn from your own personal experience. Like, well, that was fucking dumb. I'm not going to do that shit again, yep. but it's, it's more along the sense of, well, Scott, Hey, Hey guys, I was in a situation whenever you teach a class and you're like, all right, cool, Bob, I was up against a wall with multiple targets. This is how, this is how it went down. Right. Like right. there was no, there was no cadence to my multiple target drill. Like, and I was like, Oh, okay. Well, fucking Bob's been in, you know, a thousand direct action hits. I'll probably listen to Bob when it comes to these things, or I'll probably listen to Mike Glover. I'll, I'll listen to these guys that have been in these types of engagements. Right. Um, right. 
same thing with police officers, right? Like there are a lot of great law enforcement instructors that have no military experience. Um, but they, but they have, they have that law enforcement experience and there's like, for example, Will Petty, you know, he's a plethora of information, his whole team. Um, phenomenal guys. Center yeah. Um, are they coming to the soul mill? Yes. Yeah. They were here. Chase was here uh, in June or July. They okay. Run together and then they'll be back. And I'm pretty awesome. sure it'll be Will in late November, early December. So it's like the last week of November into the first week of December. Yeah. The so, lowest, right, so you, of course. Yeah. So you look at guys like Will Petty on the VCQB side of things, the high-risk vehicle stop side of things. You look at other guys like you have Jiu-Jitsu 5 Invictus. Uh, you know, these guys are teaching defensive tactics, uh, you know, Jiu-Jitsu for cops, right? So this, you know, these are things – Obviously, you have Henry Gracie doing his GST thing. Yeah. Um, he was never a police officer, but, I mean, you know, just like I said before, his family is so involved in right. violence his control. Perspective. His, his whole perspective. Of, you know, yeah. again, I mean, again, my my professor would would destroy any police officer that, you know, attempted yeah. to, to try to control yeah. him. You know, obviously, he wouldn't do that because he's a nice fucking guy. But, yeah. you know, you know, the fact of the matter is, too, is, is to kind of – bring it around is you talk about the civilians training, right? The public training, right. and you talk about the amount of law enforcement training and the comparison is, well, some, some people that train that are, are not, are not police officers have better quality training and train more and care more right. about, about level training. How do you, as an instructor, as a former cop, um, how do you, approach that mindset well for me first off it, it's words or icons right so teacher mentor coach that's how I look at how we're to approach the 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 ever lasting pursuit of crushing status quo in law enforcement and in life period teacher mentor coach you, you know you need to find someone who is going to show you what you can do not what they can do right yeah it's great they're great they're great at doing that thing, but then can they teach you how to do that thing? Can they teach you how to, to, to have proper fitness? Can they teach you how to fight? Can they teach you how to, to really productively and efficiently use a firearm, right? The three Fs, fitness, fighting, firearms. So to me, if you're in this realm, if you're in the law enforcement realm, military, even a civilian, man, that ever conscious seeker of knowledge, you need to know that I'm going to find a reputable individual or group of individuals, a, a, company that is going to seek to help me grow as an individual and whatever the skill set is that I'm seeking to learn more about. And that is, you know, you have, and that's why here, especially at the sawmill, I am constantly guarding our reputation that we are, we are only bringing the best out here, not because they're elitist, but because I know that they are teachers, mentors, and coaches. That is my that is, that is my litmus test. Do they teach? Do they mentor? Do they coach? Or do they just regurgitate information? And again, we have that instructor mindset. You know, the whole yup, yup, knife oh, hand. yeah. Freaking big hat. Yeah, the red shirts. So mentality. Yeah, and the old red shirts. If you ever ask, yeah, exactly. If you ever ask someone why, and they can't explain it, or they just don't say, hey, you know, this is why, or, hey, I, you know, here's another reason why, or here's another perspective, or let's figure it out together. You know, like, I don't right. know. Hey. If they can't give you the why behind the what, then you need to find somebody that can. Sure, and this is this is the thing too is is for those listening, ask why, because right. that yeah. was one thing when I went for my sergeant interview. They asked me what is what is one of your faults, like what is one of your weaknesses, and what is one of your strengths. And I I literally said I ask why, and it's and it's not. And it's the thing is if if your instructor takes the why as disrespect. That is your, that is your, that is your cue Bang, to pop it. fucking smoke. Yep. Say, I would like a refund or, right. or, or just walk away because from that, because from that point on, it's, well, you're not believing me what I'm telling you. No, it's, I'm just asking why, why are we doing this drill? Why are we, why are we training this way? Why is your curriculum this way? And again, it's not a thing. I mean, you know, you don't want to ask it like, well, why are we doing this? This is stupid, right? Just, just hey, right. hey. You know, legitimate why, why? Yeah. Right. And not every time you do a drill, but 
there should be depth and understanding. Like, why would we use this? Is it, is it, is this skill building? Is this, is this a tactical application? What is it that we're doing here? And, you know, and, and a good, good teacher is going to tell you why. Yes. And it's the thing too. The purpose of that drill. Right. And that's, and that can go with anything Mm -hmm. like, and that can go with when you're in a specific situation or you're training a specific tactic, whether it be firearms, whether it be, uh, you know, jujitsu, why am I placed here? Why am I this way? What happens if it's opposed? What, you know, what are my options from here? And this is the thing is, is until you start asking those questions, your growth uh, in, in the tactical realm and the being prepared realm is going to be, is going to be capped. Right. And we have to, and we never want to catch, just like you said, you're always, you're always a student, always a student. Sometimes and, a teacher, always a student. That's yeah, right. Exactly right. And this thing is teaching or coaching or instructing, however you want to call it is a great way, excuse me, is a great way to learn because it's, it's because it's again, it's fresh in the mind. You're going to find your way to teach. And again, there are guys that I've, I've attended classes, most highly experienced dudes, terrible instructors. Yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. It was like, yeah. dude, I get it. You did all this cool shit and you're a phenomenal shooter. You're a phenomenal <laughs> you know, jujitsu artist or whatever, but you are not, you are not, relaying this information it's not digestible and and that is where you get people to go yeah dude this guy's a badass but is it worth the six hundred dollars of my hard-earned money to to take it or is there a guy that is a phenomenal instructor that doesn't have as much experience but i'm gonna get i'm gonna get more out of it and i think that's where it's important to ask why and ask other people like for example, if I don't know, an inch, just, just like you said, it's okay to have elitist come train at the sawmill. Like if I come to the sawmill for training, you best believe I want the fucking best of the best. I want the, I want the guy with the most experience and the best instruction that I can get. Because why? Because uh-huh. I also value my time, right? Like, right. I, I mean, I don't want to spend a week at the sawmill. Granted, the sunsets are phenomenal that you post, but like, you know, I don't want to spend a week at the sawmill and just get something that's like, well, I kind of, I got, I got, I, I took away two things. And even though that's, that's great. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What if I could have taken away four things? You know what I mean? So it's always that always strive to be better. But um, the the question is, is that if you go to these, go to a training course and as a civilian law enforcement military, whatever the case may be, are you walking away better than when you entered? Are you walking away with, with, even if it's that that one big thing, we always do light bulb moments at the end of class. And the class was the one thing you took away that really stood out, you know, because again, you know, it's hard for us when you get, you get eight hour class of just nonstop information. You may be reviewing fundamentals. You may be going over doing those drills and stuff you've already done before, but it's also a, a means to an end. There's a purpose behind those and they're building blocks, if you will. And so, yeah, you want to feel like you've walked away with way more, but that was like, you know, people say, all right, what's that one thing that I really gained that, that I'd like, it was like, aha, you know, and yeah. I learned from the students as well. I'm always learning something from people that's the point man you know learn from you you know and that's how you want to be a seeker right that's one of the things i always say be a seeker of knowledge yeah dude, that's, that's the thing it is is you know um i got a review on this podcast yesterday and it was a guy he said he has 25 years experience as a cop um he just left he just retired and he thought that uh, the second episode of the podcast with Suresh was, was great. And he said something about expert. And I was like, hold up, hold up. I said, look, bro, I don't claim to be an expert in absolutely anything. Right. I mean, I like food. I could probably talk about food, but like when it comes to anything else, I don't claim to be an expert. I claim to have my experience and I claim to have learned from others. Um, and this is why like I give credit where credit is due. Like I've definitely learned from you. Um, especially on the fitness aspect, that's definitely something I kind of want to get into with you. Cause you know, when I describe Scott, if somebody goes describe Scott, you know, without showing a picture, I go, okay, have you ever seen the movie, the expendables, right? You have all these like jacked, like kind of old bearded dudes that just like go around just shooting all kinds of crazy shit. I was like, that's, that's basically Scott in a nutshell. And they're like, I can actually picture Scott. And I was like, see, yeah, that's funny, so, man. That's yeah, funny. dude. So, this, so this is the thing: is is you know, Scott, you're no spring chicken. Like you've been around the block, right? So, 28 last week, man. I turned 48. 
48. 48. And this dude looks like he, he's fucking, he's a fucking monster, right? So check him out, guys, uh, at the sawmill. But start a favorite hard to kill. That A, dude, that's, that's the facts right there. And so let's kind of talk about how your fitness evolved from when you were, I don't know, 18 to being a cop or, excuse me, when you were 18 in the military, contractor, law enforcement, right. kind of go through that kind of progression of what you learned, what you picked up along the way, and what you realized, well, that was fucking stupid because there's a lot of those in fitness. Yeah, yeah, I've had those and I've got those. So I started out uh, high school, you know, just uh, just in general athlete, trying to just, you know, just figure out what I like to do. We did wrestling, you know, played around. We did a lot of whole, whole lot of full contact basketball, you know. Full contact, you know, just yard football stuff. But basketball ended up. Owls don't exist. Yeah, exactly. You know the deal. And then uh, we call it Merle's Inlet style. And, uh, <laughs> dude, I don't know why where it came from, but it just you know we used to play that way. And so, um, and then you know just became a meathead in learning from a bunch of old meatheads that were in um, in the gym. You know, Gold's Gym in Myrtle Beach. And then I worked at Sands Club as a as a fitness attendant just to get a free membership. So it was this hotel gym that had everything the whole night, man. So I worked there, and those dudes took me under their wing and, and taught me how to lift weights. Well, you know, I'd say there's probably where I ran into – well, actually, I'll tell you that back. I ran into the powerlifting is where I really got in trouble later on. But from, uh, from doing that meathead stuff, you know, just bodybuilding, just lifting heavy weights, whatever it took to get stronger, bigger, to – to, you know, going to the Marine Corps, getting injured, getting out, then going into law enforcement later on, um, understanding the value of, of athletics. But I got into powerlifting is, is when I started having some problems, man, like just stupid, stupid movement just to lift a lot of weight, like benching, and that's where I ran into trouble. And, that, and my advice to always now to kids is unless you're just going to compete in powerlifting, don't lift like a power lifter, lift like an athlete, you know? And there's so much knowledge out there now that I didn't have when I was a kid coming up on how to move properly. We had the old football coaches. This is how you do it, son. And I'm looking at this dude. He's got a big gut. He's got like uh, very little advice. muscle definition. And he's trying to teach me how to lift weights. I, that should have been a sign right there. And I think what's brilliant now is that, is that you know, back then compared to now, kids coming up have the, the technology at their fingertips compare – what they're learning in school to what they what they should be learning, and that is proper movement, movement screening. There's so many different methodologies that, that will teach you proper movement screening. And if you look at the Army, for instance, as an example, they, they are now uh, – Donnie Bingham is brilliant. Donnie Brent Bingham has brought a whole new perspective of teaching regular Army athlete kids how to be athletes, not just the special operations community. So that's brilliant because they're just not getting the physical fitness like they used to. So they're having to change with the times and it's brilliant. So, um, and then fast forward to doing contract work or for black work for five years or one of, you know, really I saw CrossFit, didn't really understand it, but uh, still did a lot of functional fitness. I'd already been doing that for years, plyometrics, kettlebell swings, you name it, man, sandbags, just, just good movement stuff. And then put it all together when I learned this thing called CrossFit. Of course, did that for a while, coached that for a while, and we did it as a team in Afghanistan. So my first workout was at like 8,000 feet in Gardez, Afghanistan, and, and I was it was coming out of both ends, and uh, it was nasty, right? So I was like, all right, I'm on to something here. This is, I like this. So the intensity ramped up into my, in my late 30s and into my early 40s. I've had to back off now being more intelligent with good movement and I don't have to do it as much, man, as I've matured, my body's matured, my muscles matured, my movement's matured. Of course, it hurts more, recovery takes longer, but it's, it's smart fitness. I don't grind under the barbell as much as I used to. I, I like to do back squat, front squat, clean, stuff like that. Yeah. But, but I don't mess around with snatches anymore with the barbell. I don't really mess around with overhead squats. A lot of the stuff I do is with, with brute force, brute force sandbags, baby. Uh, kettlebells. I got my adjustable kettlebells, Kettlebell King. I love those. I can take those anywhere. And what's beautiful about those kettlebells is that they are made like competition bells and they split in half like an egg and they can, there's, there's stackable weights in there. So I get real good, good, solid position on those. And I can oh, use that's those. That's cool as shit. Dude, they're badass. They are. That's cool as shit. Kettlebell Kings, they are brilliant. That, that design yeah. is brilliant. So it goes, it goes from like 
15 pounds if it's empty, give or take, all the way up to 70 pound kettlebell. Oh, that's plenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're ergonomic. They're tight. They move. You can. They're solid. So that's awesome. Get, yeah, check those out. And then of course, brute force, man. They have everything sure. you need. I love my brute ball that Justin gave me. Justin gave me a brute ball um, at the TSAC conference in Virginia Beach, circa 2000 and like. 15, 14, 15. I still got that thing, man. And I and I, I told him like he fixed it for me, and I want. I said I want it back because he gave yeah. it to me, right. So um, I got that, and I use that thing. It stays in my truck everywhere I go. If I travel, it goes with me. So now my movement is intelligent movement, where it's about sustaining muscle mass, but keeping the tubes flowing right, and at the same time working on and maintaining my flexibility as I get older and more mature. So uh, my training consists of a lot more, um, you know, simple movement stuff, you know, a lot of transverse plane stuff, a lot of rotational stuff, hitting the bags, you know, still maintaining my strength and then trying to get back into grappling, man. But I'm like, a, I'm like out here by myself, you know, it's I tough. need to get back in the jets. It's tough, man. So tough. It's tough. I just stumbled across, uh, just matter of fact, he's still here. Ryan Jensen's here um, with uh, complete – uh, tactical consulting, you know, if you've heard of Brian Jensen, eight-time UFC uh, fighter and just a, a brilliant dude, man. His system that he has now that has the combative piece in it is, is holistic. It's it's 360-degree comprehensive yeah. system, and it's, dude, it's brilliant. It's so awesome. I never get involved in that and, and just, you know, I've got mats out here. I've got all my stuff out here, and I just cut myself a nice big swath of, of, of uh, big sandy. Technically, it's the horseshoe pit. But it's also PT and combatives area. Back oh, here nice. We got to come up there and host a class. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, kind of to take it back to your approach about 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 lifting intelligently, and that's something where when I was in college, I I did P90X a few times, and sure. uh, I was like, cool, whatever. And then it got super boring, um, and then I was just like, I just want to lift and get strong. And I kind of did the same thing you did. I just max out every day. Everything yeah, was heavy. Yeah. And sure, like, you know, when you're younger, yeah, you're going to pack on muscle. You're going to do whatever. You can drink beer and eat deer meat and be fine. Sure. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as I, as I got older, um, you know, I realized I was just, it's just like you said, I didn't have to work out as much. Um, yeah. My, my mindset, my mission changed. Um, you know, I did, I did cross it for a while too. And then I realized that was stupid. Um, because I was, I was destroying my body, um, for what? And so this is kind of why at effect, this is why we started basically effective fitness to give people that resource of the latest in research form correction all. Cause again, this is something that these are these things that I didn't have, right. Yeah. I didn't have programming. It was, you, you just do this and then, and, then, and then you're done and programming, you know, the minimal effective dose approach is kind of what we use because especially for law enforcement and guys that want to be prepared, anybody is if you're training for a reason, like especially your fitness is extremely important because it's, it's, again, I say it, I preach it all the time. It's the foundation of survival. If, if you're working out so hard that the next day or the next three days, you're so sore, you can't move, then what are you training for? You're training to be harder to kill, but yet you walk like a newborn baby deer after leg day. Like, you got to be able to repeat it every day, man. It, exactly. And this, is, and this is extremely important. This is why I love your approach to fitness. This is why, I, you know, I love your kettlebell stuff. I love I love your club stuff. Yeah, um, man, I love the maces. The yeah, dude, they're, they're, they're great. Like, you know, just like you said, that, that, that transverse plane rotational stuff, the trunk, the trunk stability. Um, again, it's not sexy. It's not the beach muscles. But it's the muscles that matter, right? Because they directly translate into shooting, yep. grappling, yep. survivable skills that that you need to have. Carrying a person, it, your bicep does very little work. Just want to make that very clear, yep. right? It's it's straight trunk and leg strength and and hamstring and lower back. And you know this is why I love your approach to fitness because you and I basically have. I would. I'd be confident saying we have about a hundred percent similarity there when it yeah. comes to um, application of fitness uh, for law enforcement. Because there is one thing you said, and I've I've actually posted this, but you're a, you're a cop kryptonite. Yeah, man. L L L four L five compression issues, man. You got yeah, like you just brutal. said it. You got a strong back. You got a strong butt. 
those two things correlate to a strong body. And if you've got both of those, you won't have those issues. And again, exactly. it goes back. Listen, we sit in a car all day, man, you know, and you, you get the belt on. It's not natural. In the sitting position, we've already, it's already been proven, you know, right. Kelly Starrett, you know, he really brought it to light in a huge way for a lot of people mainstream is that you can't sit all day, man. It's terrible for you. I got a stand up desk right here. I'm, I'm sitting down right now because they're not be all over the place, but you know, um, it's hard to believe. I know I'm hot strong, but, uh, are you? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's revelation. You're like a I mean, mal, dude. Dude. Yeah. Speaking of which, and man, I got tennis to... ball, butterflies, anything. Yeah, right? yeah. Squirrel, squirrel. Fucking but yeah, it, it's again, you, you, you got to squat every day, man, you know, and you, you got to move, you know, move. motion is lotion, you know, oh, that's, and that's it, why, you know, and this is why, you know, this is, I think this is you and I, why we've also stayed in contact so long is because our similarities and our missions are basically in line. And I, I am so glad that, uh, you know, you are now developing the sawmill into, into its true potential. Cause I, I can't believe it's already been a year, uh, for you at the sawmill and that's, and that's phenomenal. So guys, Scott Puckett, really good buddy of mine. Um, get your ass at the fucking sawmill and go train. Um, guys, they, uh, Scott, so where can they find, so where can the listeners find more information about your classes, uh, that you guys are hosting? Okay. A couple different ways. One is the sawmill TTC.com sawmill TTC.com. That's our website. All our events on there. Frequently asked questions cover, you know, the do's and don'ts, what we do, what we don't do, et cetera. Social media, of course, you know, we're still using that, uh, necessary evil, the Instagram, <laughs> Facebook, you know, right. I know, dude, I, you know, the sawmill TC, the at the sawmill TC. And then of course on Facebook, the sawmill, and uh, I think it's the same name, but then, you know, we've got those conduits for communication and, and that's a lot of stuff we push out through the IG and then it posts on Facebook. Um, those are, those are it. And of course, you know, just coming here, man, and looking at our class schedule, looking at the all-star lineup that we have here of, of people come out, train and take advantage of it. And because here's the deal, man, I've changed and I I wanted the mindset here to be about trust and relationships, right? I want people to trust that we're going to give them solid information. I want them to come here and feel like they're part of the family, the tribe, if you will. Eat, sleep, train, repeat, man. Be the destination training location. And no matter what your background is, I love to see brand spanking new green people. It fires me up. We had a guy in a class a couple weeks ago. He'd never been to a firearms range before. The dude was from Mass. Massachusetts, he'd come in. He was almost not going to come. He was intimidated. He shows up here. He catches me in the gym the day before the class. He's going to train with Charlie Melton, Charlie Mike Precision. Yeah. And he's all like, whoa, man, I, you know, I just wanted to see what I was getting myself into and almost didn't come. And, you know, uh, and I was like, look, man, I said, these dudes put their pants on the same way you do, right? And you, we're, we're human beings and people, it's just about what route and what journey they took to lead them to where they are at that rare moment. A journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. So the dude came here, man. It was he is the epitome of crushing status quo. I, I, I he, he earned that coin that I have. Earn it every day. Again, goes back to why we should, as Americans, earn the sacrifice of those that have given the ultimate sacrifice for our country. That flag, man. That stars. That's why every day, every time we start an event here, it's, it's the pledge of allegiance, man. And Absolutely. Earn it every day. It goes back to crushing status quo, man. And that's what I, that's the culture I want to be here. It's not, it's a real culture. It's not one of a facade that, Hey, we only do it on events, man. We live that every day. Look at me, man. I got bags under my eyes. It's go, go, go. I'm not, it's not a badge of honor, man. I want this thing to succeed, dude. I want it to, to be, a, to win for everybody, man. And, and, and I know it's hard to tell, but I'm a little excited about it. No, man. And we see your passion and this is, and this is the thing, Scott, you know, again, this is why, you and I have stayed in contact is because we are, we are the same mindset. We, we want people to be better. We want them to, we, we want them to know that they are capable of more than they think they are. And that is, that is where people, I think they doubt themselves. They say, Oh, you know, I'll never be good at this. Just like this. You're better than the motherfucker sitting on the couch. That's right. You're better. You're more prepared than the guy that is sitting there watching YouTube videos going, right. oh, so this is what I need to do in this situation? Get right. your ass out there. Go train. Hit the weights. Hit the range. Hit the mats. Be prepared because, again, when it's your time, when it's, when it's your time to shine, 
you right. got you got one option. That's action. And if you can't take it, and you right. don't have it. Well, then you know what's going to happen. Well, then that's that's on you. But guys, follow right. my boy Scott. Scott, can I give your personal page? Yeah, 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 man. Yeah. Follow my boy Scott at Scott S C O T T Mo M O E Puckett P U C K E T T. Guys, Scott's a phenomenal resource. Reach out to him. Reach out to the sawmill if your agency needs training or you guys need a location to train. You guys have shoot houses. You guys have. Uh, uh, we got a lot of housing legal. available. Um, we, got, we got a lodge, yeah, forty-four man lodge, forty-more person lodge. Man, it's cozy, cozy, cozy. There you go, guys. You guys, you guys, perfect location. Get out there and train, Scott. We're gonna have you on again, and we'll get up soon, brother. Thank you for coming. All on. right, sounds good, man. It's good talking to you, Adam. Take care. All right, guys. Bro. All right, man. Bye.